I, I'm a big believer that there's no method because not only is it not going to fit for everybody, but it's not going to, if you look at a 10 to 12 year market cycle, no strategy is, is perfect for every year in a market cycle. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll, I'll use the Burr strategy, for example, right? And, and by the way, I love, you know, the Burr strategy, you know, Brandon Turner is a very good friend of ours. You know, we love bigger pockets, but him and I have literally had discussions how the Burr strategy does not work every single year if you look at a market cycle. So, I mean, especially now, I would not do the Burr strategy right now. Sam and Daniel, thank you for joining me for our Thought Leader Spotlight series. I'm your host, Matt Camp, Head of Partnerships for Deal Machine. And on these, we really like to shine a spotlight on industry experts like you guys who have inspiring stories and really um, educate our audience on the lessons that you've learned and where you see the market of all things. So uh, today, really excited to welcome on Sam and Daniel, or you might know them better as the Quack Brothers on their social media channels on uh, you know, YouTube and the like. Um, you're real estate investors, mentors, authors. You've been investing since age 22 and 20. Um, and you are today a mentor and also a coach for countless newbies that are just getting into real estate. So uh, really excited to have you both on. Yeah, excited as well. Yeah. Uh, to start, can you maybe talk a little bit more beyond that bio about your journey in real estate investing and um, how you guys got to where you are today? Yeah, Daniel, I want to kick it off. No, why, why don't you go ahead and talk about our story? Because I, I think I could provide a lot more of the technical knowledge. So why don't, why don't you tell a story first, and then I can chime in at the yeah. end. Yeah. So we started back in 2014. Um, you know, we, uh, we got interested in, you know, real estate investing through uh, reading books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Really, it all started back in um, 2013, um, our, our business venture, right? So uh, Daniel and I had a, another different business. Uh, it's a whole different video uh, for another day. Uh, but we had a whole different business and um, being in that business, we wanted to grow. We want to do this whole, you know, the whole self-development thing, right? So one of the, the books that was in our, in our reading list was Rich Dad Poor Dad, read it and we were, and Dana are like, holy crap, like this is a whole brand new world that I didn't, I didn't even know about that existed. And um, it, op it definitely opened my eyes because here I am thinking, well, the only way to be successful is either grow a business or have a, have a really good job. Well, this, this whole idea of, of being an investing real estate, uh, acquiring assets to pay for your, 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 your lifestyle uh, was, a, was a huge eye opener for me, right? So we got excited, started watching YouTube videos about it, uh, reading other books about it. I mean, it was just a rabbit hole of, of getting as much information about real estate investing at the time. Uh, but there was a problem. For, I mean, it was a big problem for us. The, the big problem was that um, well, number one, we didn't have the money. We were 21 and 19 years old at the time. You know, we, all we had was just an excitement to our name. That was it, passion and excitement. So we get to a spot where we realize, crap, like we're stuck. We, you know, we're not going to be able to buy real estate anytime soon. We're going to have to wait, save money, or do other kinds of stuff. You know, we, we even tried doing wholesaling. We even tried doing, uh, you know, tried getting a loan, but neither of those work. So 2014, 2015, we, we you know, um, again, YouTube videos, reading books as much as possible, um, started buying courses with the, the little money that we had. In fact, we actually got into debt buying courses, um, spent nearly 20 grand on wow. coaching and, and courses that, out, that are out there. And um, I think the, the more valuable piece to that was through, you know, our, our journey of learning and and. Uh, attending seminars, doing courses, uh, we got to meet with some key people in our, even in our own area that were doing real estate and they were doing it really well. Um, you know, I would say they were mildly, mildly successful looking back and they gave us, um, I think just enough information to kind of go and do some more research. And um, so kind of fast forward, I know there's a lot of details in that, but fast forward, uh, one of the concepts we discovered in real estate investing strategy uh, is this concept of the concept of owner financing. Now, for those who don't know what owner financing is, it's this whole idea of be, being able to buy properties using um, not, not, not uh, um, loans or bank financing, but um, allowing the seller to finance the purchase for you. Meaning you make monthly payments to the seller uh, and you get in exchange, you get the, uh, the ownership right of the property. So being able to do, buy real estate that way you don't need any credit. You don't need to go get a bank financing. You don't, you don't need to get underwritten, which was especially attractive for, to, to us at, at the time, 22 and 20, year, 20 years old. So mm -hmm. uh, that was the first kind of, um, 
I guess, hurdle that we were able to over overcome, right? Not having to go and get bank financing and none of that. But the next hurdle was, well, the sellers that we, that we were talking to were asking for down payments, right? They were asking, hey, can you at least do put 5,000 down or 10,000 down or, you know, 15% down, whatever the case might be. So there was another obstacle for us. But again, having, you know, a bank of knowledge and, and going through experiences and, 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 and it's really what I like to call an aggregated learning, right? We spent literally two or three years really trying to learn this and craft, you know, master the crafts, so to speak. Uh, one of the skill sets we also discovered was raising capital, raising money. And um, to me, that it, it didn't dawn on me until I watched the episode of Shark Tank, where a guy win, you know, wins you know, money, get, gets um, investments from, got an investment from Ms., uh, Mr. Kevin O'Leary, and he walks away with like $100,000. And I'm like, holy smokes, like maybe we can do that, but for real estate, right? This guy had a, a phenomenal business plan, business idea. Well, we have also really good deals that, that could be potentially profitable. Why can't we do the same? So that's when Daniel and I started going out there, creating key strategic relationships with doctors, lawyers, individuals that, that had a lot of money. And here we brought knowledge, time, and experience, a little bit of experience to play. And um, it was ba basically um, a marriage between people who have the money and, of course, us that have the knowledge. Uh, we're always out there looking for deals and, and, and sourcing deals. So that, uh, that has allowed us to buy uh, one property after another property. Uh, the first time we raised money was $60,000 uh, from a close family, family friend, which we were able to use that to put, put a down payment on for single family acquisition, owner financing, so we didn't have to use our own money. And you know, we were, now we're building equity. We're, we got cash flow coming in. We got some track record, which then allow us, allowed us to propel to go and acquire more properties that year. So that year was 2017. And we, at the end of the year, we, we ended up acquiring close to 77 units, um, 77 units of rentals in that, in that year. And then Daniel and I both looked at each other and we got bored. And Daniel said, you know, let's, let's start working on this private equity thing. And um, late, I think it was last year when Daniel really put the pieces together and he can tell you more about that. But that's kind of the journey where um, from 2014 to really 2017, we didn't do any deal. Like we just focused all of our time and energy, um, A, surviving, but also learning as much as possible, getting mentors, um, uh, coaching courses, book. I and mean, we spent a lot of money and time uh, where some people would quit maybe halfway through, but we didn't. We we were we were obsessed. We were passionate about it, um, and and we really wanted to see our goal and, and vision come to life. So um, obviously, Daniel Daniel can kind of get into technicalities, but that's kind of the story, the roadmap of the Quack Brothers, and where where we are today. Yeah. And do you think like, you know, for uh, just because you coach so many new, new real estate investors and people just getting into it, do you recommend them going that route as well in terms of that intense of an education or, or how do you, is there a way that you can, uh, you know, that you recommend accelerating that for them or how, how do you kind of coach them through that first stage? Yeah. So luckily we made all the mistakes for them, right? So we know what worked and what didn't. So we're here to tell people like, you don't have to spend three years trying to figure this out, right? Um, you know, bootstrapping it as, as people will call it. Like we, we put together a, a pretty much a blueprint and a system on how it works. And, um, you know, Daniel and I having seen, seen these processes over and over and over, you know, we know what works and what doesn't, right? What, what turns to make at certain direction, you know, certain part of the deal or, um, you know, what type of pitfalls to avoid when creating partnerships. Um, so yeah, the, the, the beautiful thing is, you know, when you, when you have someone that has done it already, you don't have to try to, you know, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Um, right. You can work with people who have figured it out, turn it into a system and use that system to succeed on your own as well. Yeah. Well, what are, uh, you know, obviously this is a broad question, but what are some of those most common mistakes that you see that make, you know, that you see any newbie in real estate investing make today that, you know, uh, maybe outline a couple for us that, you know, hey, these are immediately ones you should be thinking about it when you're getting into this. Yeah, Daniel could probably answer that question really well. He, he sees that all the time. Yeah, I, I would probably differ actually to what Sam said. Um, and and as, as much as obviously I love my brother, you know, uh, I, I'd say I'd probably actually disagree with his, his uh, recent answer uh, to a degree, right? Not not 100% because, I mean, we did spend a lot of time. We always disagree. That's, that's just, this is how it works. 
<laughs> friction I, pretty I, you know, baby. Brothers, you know? I, you know, I tell people, you know, Sam, Sam's answer is, you know, spoke, spoken like a true marketer, right? We, we've got the blueprint, you know, come on, come all, right? Uh, so I, I would say, you know, in reality, right, um, there's, there's a lot of things that we did that, that yes, you know, a lot of the do's and don'ts, but, you know, sometimes what, what didn't work for us may work for somebody else. You know, I, I've seen it happen all the time, even with my students, you know, when I, when I train them every single week, every single day, I mean, there have been a couple of times, not a lot, right, uh, but a couple of times where I've actually blatantly told some of my students, hey, like, don't do that. Uh, and they've actually challenged me. They're like, well, Daniel, this is my plan. Like, this is what, this is why I do what I do. I'm, I'm taking some of the other stuff that you taught, you know, uh, outside of that one point, and, and we want to do this and it, it works, you know? So if, if anything, I try to, I try to institute our students, you know, look, you know, every, every real estate is local. There's, I'm, I'm, I'm so tired. One of my biggest pet peeves is when a lot of these other gurus and coaches say there's a one size fits all method to doing every deal. You know, I, I've been doing this long enough and I've done enough of these. I've spoken to hundreds and thousands of sellers and I've coached and mentored hundreds and thousands of individuals. There, there never is a one size. Fits. I'm, I'm a big believer that God has created every single one of us very differently. Therefore, every deal is going to be different. Every seller, every investor, every appraiser, attorney, manager, I mean, you name it, everybody's going to be different. So for, for, for them is, well, how can I teach them the skills to at least be resourceful you know, that way, no matter what ingredients or what factors are in the deal, they can find success and they, and they can find a path to victory. So when it comes to, you know, I'll, I'll kind of address your question, Matt, you know, some, some questions that, you know, the question you said was, you know, well, what are the things, right? What are, what are some of the most common rookie mistakes, you know, that, that people make? Um, and I'd say one of them, the, the first thing that pops into my mind is, you know, everybody has the desire to raise capital. You know, I mean, we, we hear it all the time, right? I mean, everybody's brother and sisters and boyfriend, whatever, wants to raise capital to learn how to do real estate deals. Uh, one of the, that, and that's kind of one of the most common rookie mistakes is they, they, see, they see their ability and their need and their gap to raise capital, but they never see their ability to actually execute and allocate that capital. Um, so I'd say to kind of sum it up, the, the big rookie mistake is people see that raising capital as the end goal. Uh, if anything, that's kind of just the beginning, because now, you know, you have to do what your job is, which is to allocate and mitigate the risk of that capital. Uh, so there's one. Another, another one I'd say is probably uh, when looking at the deal, only paying attention to the cash flow. Uh, that's a really big rookie mistake that I see because, you know, myself included, but a lot of other, you know, experienced, you know, top notch. I call them black belt real estate investors. Cash flow, a lot of times for them is the last thing they even think about. The first thing they think about is the risk. You know, how can we mitigate the risk of this particular deal or portfolio, or how do we risk, you know, mitigate the risk of this market? Then they talk about the cash flow. So, you know, I, I always seen it and I've observed it, but it seems the best. They always protect their downside and, and the upside always takes care of themselves. A lot of the amateurs, they pay attention to the upside and they think they take care of the downside, but they don't, they really don't. Yep. But I mean, both of those are a great way to kind of reframe your mindset. And, and like you said, you know, the, especially raising capital, like, uh, you know, that, that's just a means to an end. Like that's the beginning of the, the journey. Right. So uh, 100% agree there. Um, I think, I mean, you guys wrote a book on talking about that journey from the zero to 77 units, you said in, in one year. Um, I know you've kind of termed this force strategy um, to acquire those deals. And I know, um, Daniel, you just mentioned like, hey, uh, you know, there's not a one size fits all strategy necessarily. It's about a toolbox of things to, to use based on your market. But um, can you kind of give our audience the, the playbook behind that force strategy and what it is and how our audience can, can uh, you know, leverage that? Yeah, so it's uh, the book is titled Zero to 75 Units in One Year. Uh, we decided to title it 75 because it's more marketable. <laughs> so um, easy to remember. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it is. It is what it is. Right. As much as I love real estate and I love teaching, I mean, they're, the marketing piece is, is the most important piece. Right. It's, it's there for a reason. So the four strategy is an acronym that stands for uh, find a deal. Right. Uh, owner financing, raise the capital, cash flow it and then expand the empire. Right. So it's the C and cash flow represents kind of the management structure of your business, taking care of your cash flow. And then the E stands for uh, expand your empire. There's, there's a lot of people who know how to do deals, but don't know how to do a business. Um, and that's kind of what that E stands for. So that's pretty much our acronym. Now, in terms of the one size fits all, um, I, I'm a big believer that there's no method because not only is it not going to fit for everybody, but it's not going to, if you look at a 10 to 12 year market cycle, no strategy is, is 
perfect for every year in a market cycle. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I'll, I'll use the Burr strategy, for example, right? And, and by the way, I love, you know, the Burr strategy. You know, Brandon Turner is a very good friend of ours. You know, we love bigger pockets, but him and I have literally had discussions how the Burr strategy does not work every single year if you look at a market cycle. So, I mean, especially now, I would not do the Burr strategy right now. You know, and because if you look at the way that the central banking systems is positioned, if you look at, you know, the equity lines of the valuations of uh, properties and assets in the housing market, um, it is not a good time for you to implement a strategy where you purchase a property, especially at such a high cost of acquisition. And you're really depending on that yield of your equity to be able to exit you out to the property. And then you not only that, but you're building your entire scalability on that model. And, and it's tough because at the end of the day, you're really working backwards if you do that. Um, what I would recommend, however, is as much biased as it sounds, the four strategy works beautifully right now. Because, you know, one of the things I'm telling all our investors is, you know, now, is, especially now, right, is the time to really do these owner financing deals where you can lock in a long-term fixed rate financing with the seller. Whereas every bank you talk to right now, and this goes for, you know, anybody from your amateur real estate investor that wants to do a duplex as their first deal in six months, to, you know, like my buddy, Michael Episcope, who I talked to yesterday, who, you know, their company Origin Investments has almost a billion dollars in AUM. You know, they have 1800 investors. So, I mean, this, this advice goes to every single one of them. What the banks are doing right now is they want to lock in individuals to short-term balloons and swap rate financing. What that means is the banks really do not like this short-term, they really don't like this low interest rate market that we're in because it, it hurts their margin. And we're seeing that with how much the reposition market has grown the last 18 months. I mean, it's, all, it's over a trillion dollars as of last month. So it's just a testament to what the banks are really wanting and not wanting out of the capital markets and real estate. So, you know, if we look, if we pay attention to that, the four strategy works beautifully because it's a strategy that's contingent on you, not only uh, minimizing your down payment, but you're locking in long-term secure financing, which mitigates the risk of what the banks are giving now which is, hey, we want you to balloon in three to five years. And oh, by the way, in three to five years, the value of your property most likely is going to be 20 to 30% lower than what it is today. That is a nightmare waiting to happen. And that is probably one of the, the most common mistakes I see people making right now is, is, is exactly that. Yeah. Can you, um, f- for that four strategy, can you talk through um, how to identify a deal, how to pitch it to sellers, like how to show them it's a win-win. I'd love to hear kind of the nuances of, of, of uh, you know, executing on that strategy. Yeah. Sam, why don't, why don't you take this one? Yeah. So as far as this four strategy, um, I mean, I guess I, it depends on where you, got, where you want to start, right? Because <laughs> um, I guess the, the, the framework of the four strategy, it starts with finding the deal. Um, you know, it always starts with that. And I think you know, if I'm going to do a quick little plug, right? Deal machine can definitely help you find the deals, right? Mm-hmm. I could definitely have, and, and I think one of the useful, uh, and one, one thing right off the bat uh, that, that I discovered with deal machine is it, it tells you, um, you know, who, if it's whether, whether it's, it's being owned by a landlord or not and um, who the landlord even is. Um, and one thing, one of the ways that we, we were able to find a lot of our deals that are really successful is that if, if, there's a property that's owned by an LLC. That's a landlord. I mean, it's got to be right, and it's got to be also um, non-owner occupied. So, one thing, one of the reasons why I love landlords that have LLCs and it's not owner occupied is that if I reach out to the landlord, they most likely also have other properties as well, not just that single family. Because it, it rarely do I run into a a landlord that has a you know just one property and they put it in an LLC. It's it's just a waste of resource. Whereas I see a lot of landlords, maybe you have 10, 15, 20 rental properties, and they most likely will have an LLC because they have a lot lot more to protect. And in that case is when I reach out to them and I say, hey, I see that you, 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 know, you have this property, 123 Main Street. Would you have any chance of, or would you have any interest of selling? Normally what I get is either flat out no, or I get no, not this one, but I have another property that I want to sell. Boom. So that's, that's kind of the, the framework that I also use. One of the ta- techniques, right? a little kind of detailed, uh, but that's one of the techniques that worked really well. I have, I, in fact, I, Daniel and I are in the middle of the negotiation right now to buy a single family. And that, that seller originally sold us another property five years ago, uh, back in 2017, which is actually one of our 77 units. 
Um, and that seller is now interested in an exiting in other properties as, as well, right, as well. So um, that the property that we're looking at right now has come from that same technique that has worked in 2017, still works today. But what's interesting is that we didn't have to work for that lead. It, the seller came to us because we already built that relationship and rapport. So as time goes on, as you build relationships with sellers and you, you kind of build that reputation, even in your own market, um, it, it becomes easier and easier and easier, mainly because you have people reaching out to you instead of you doing all the, the sourcing. So that's the, the finding the deal. Owner, and the next thing is the owner financing it, which we have a, a completely... A complete system to it. Of course, Daniel mentioned it earlier, where, where, we, where we disagreed, right? Uh, as far as not all owner financing is going to be the same. And I do agree with that. Uh, there, there, there are going to be scenarios where it's kind of like judo, right? You're going to have to change techniques depending on, right, uh, mm -hmm. on your opponent. Not saying that the sellers are your opponent because, opponent, you know, you want to try to work with them as much as possible. Uh, and raising capital. But raising capital like what Daniel was alluding to earlier, what does not happen until you know you have an exit, you have a deal, you know you, you're going to be profitable, you've mitigated all the downside and risks. Um, and cash flow is the C part of it is having a really solid team. Um, and we're talking about property managers, um, general contractor, inspectors, attorney, um, maybe even a title company. But just having that team, if you don't have an ongoing team that's going to support your your rentals and your investment i've seen really really good deals turn into garbage um over over time uh and and i tell people all the time if you don't have a team um then you will become a motivated seller at one point and that's mm -hmm. you know not where you want to be at so um that's i like to say that all the time an, un, an, an uneducated investor today is the motivated seller tomorrow um, so people get into deals all the time, not having a plan, not having a team, not having a framework. And then, and, you know, of course there's, you know, here comes our clients coming in, swooping in for the deal. Right. And, and our, our, our clients are the one that comes in and buys all the mistakes. Um, but yeah, it's kind of the framework to it. And E is kind of what, what Daniel and I are doing right now. We're, we're expanding our empire. We're protecting ourselves. We're, you know, we got all kinds of legal, uh, asset protection strategies, we have really good teams, um, and it's you know we're at a point where four strategy we're, we've kind of transcended the four strategy in a in a way, but we're we're still doing it, but in a massive scale. So that's kind of the framework behind how to get started on that the four strategy. It always starts with finding the deal. Uh, if you can find the deals really well, then you have a pretty good basis to to, to do the rest, right? The ORCE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I appreciate the shout out. That's why we're here on the, on that, yeah, uh, absolutely. focus on that F right there. Um, the, so I'm curious, I know you said you're, you're, you're expanding, you know, you're on that E you're expanding your, your uh, building the empire there. As you guys have gone through that process, um, what are some of the lessons that you've learned, especially for our more advanced investors that, uh, you know, along that way on how they can scale the strategy and, and learn from what you guys have, have uh, you know, figured out there? Yeah, Daniel, did you want to take that one as far as expanding and expanding the empire? And, and maybe even like some of the, uh, on the expansion side, what are some of the, the challenges that you maybe didn't necessarily anticipate coming in um, that, that for the scaling investor they could anticipate now? Yeah, I, I can say before Daniel goes on, like it, it, it definitely requires YouTube, YouTube, and this is true for me, like it definitely requires you to put your ego aside and be willing to work with others. Um, because in the beginning of the, the game of, of real estate investing, you know, to me, it was all about me and Daniel, right? I was like, oh, you know, me and Daniel will control everything. Me, you know, Daniel and I will, will do all the deals. Daniel and I will, you know, conquer, you know, the entire earth. Uh, but there comes to a point where when you want to scale, you, you got to work with people who are, you know, smarter than you for sure, 100%. Like I work with people who are like 100 times smarter than me all the time. And then be willing to be, be willing to be a team player. I mean, at, at the level I think where Daniel and I are playing at is kind of like the NBA. You know, we have to like maximize, optimize our skill set, and and be willing to play and compete in this world where there's a there's a lot of pros. There's a lot of people who can crush us easily. But um, definitely want to hear Daniel's take on on the E part of it because he he's in that like every single day, just carving away. So, yeah. So I say there's three things. So number one is um, not everybody wants to expand. You know, I think there's this big pressure, especially being an entrepreneur in America. And that's one of the things that Sam and I feel really grateful for is we kind of grew up with a very global perspective. 
you know, because at home we were living in Korea, but at school we were living in America. And so um, not everybody wants to expand. You know, we live in a country where bigger is always better, more is always better. And sometimes that's just not the case. Um, you know, I met entrepreneurs who all they have is just 20, 30 units, and they're extremely happy because they don't have to work a job. All they do is just manage their properties. You know, they're able to have a great lifestyle, put their kids in good schools, have good food. And that's fantastic. Like I, I much rather have that then, you know, be a you know, CEO of a Fortune 500 company, but you're absolutely miserable. Um, so that's number one is, you know, ask yourself if expansion is what you really want to do, you know, because there comes a point in your craft where if you're not giving 100%, like you, it will start to show, you know. Um, so I'm a big fight fan. I love the UFC, you know, and uh, there's, a, there's a champion, a uh, well, former champion, he's retired now, but there's a guy named Habib Nurmagomedov. And, uh, you know, this, there was, I watched a documentary about him and his upbringing and what made him so great and his, his habits of success and his, you know, mental fortitude. And, you know, a reporter asked him, like, Habib, are you ever going to come back and defend your title? And he says, no, because I, I want to, but no, because the, the level of dedication that it takes to your craft to perform at that level is, is you got to make a lot of sacrifices. And I think for a lot of people, the reason why most people fail is because they write all these goals down and then life happens, right? It happens to every single individual, right? It happens to 97% that fail, right? Within the first three to five years of owning a business is they write down their goals. They say, oh, oh I'm hungry. I'm hungrier than everybody else. And I'm going to get it because I listen to Eric Thomas every morning, you know? And the reality is the problem is, is that it's not that they're lazy. It's not that they're unmotivated. It's not that they're, but the expectations of who they are and what they want has just not been addressed, Right. So that, that's number one. And number two, I'll, I'll actually pick you back off of what Sam said, and I'll actually take it even a step further. Um, you, you not only have to put your ego aside and learn to work with others, but you actually have to be intentional about putting yourselves around people who are going to give you feedback, uh, who are going to give you honest feedback. And I would actually even say honest criticism. Um, I tell leaders all the time, you know, myself included, if you're not being given feedback or being criticized at least once every other week, you're doing it wrong. You know, so for me, I, 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 I could probably list off four or five people right now that give me feedback and criticism intentionally on a weekly basis. So I, I've, I've got a buddy of mine, his name is Andy. I meet with him for an hour once a week. And Andy's a guy who's, you know, very, he's been very fortunate to work with um, some of the highest ranking CEOs of fortune 500 companies. He's worked with politics. He's worked with presidents of certain countries, you know, just helping them with leadership development. And, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to call Andy one of my close friends. And, you know, we meet once a week and that's what we do. You know, we, we talk mm -hmm. about myself as a leader and how can I develop? How can I grow? What are some things I did great? What are some things I did bad? Um, what are some things that I can improve on? Because at the end of the day, business is all about people. You know, it is all about people. So I say, uh, I'll, take, I'll take it a step further and say Sam is absolutely correct. You know, uh, and on top of that, you know, I'll, I'll put in my side and say, Man, if we're if you're not being criticized or being given feedback, if, if there's not at least one person coming up to you every other week saying, "Hey, we got to talk," um, what you did back there was not good. Like, you know, I saw you doing this. I saw you. I, you know, there, there's I noticed this about you. I just want to ask you what that's all about. Uh, so there's that second, and last but not least is as you scale. So for those of you that want to scale, um, and you want to expand, and you want to have that billion dollar company. Uh, I would I would say that the biggest thing that as you progress, and this is something that I'm learning now, is uh, you learn less about your craft and more about your people um, as you continue to grow. So you you start to value different things. So when I first started in real estate, I really valued my ability to find deals myself in, in the beginning. Well, now I have a portfolio team that does that for me, right? For our real estate, you know, private equity company. So now my 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 skill set is not more so about finding deals directly, but it's actually more about leading the people that find the deals. So the results are still the same. You're still finding deals, but you know what my role is and, and what I'm asked to do and what I am the best at is very different. So my top three things, as you scale, you know, I always say have a top three. What are your top three superpowers? My top three superpowers that I know at the end of the day I am responsible for is raising capital, allocating that capital based on what the market is doing, which means I got to know what the market's doing. Um, and last but not least is to be the leader. 
right? It's to lead the people and make sure and enforce the vision, make sure that we're headed towards the right direction and make sure that not, you know, it's not necessarily in Simon. I love what Simon Sinek said, right? A leader's job is to never to lead the charge, but it's to actually empower those that are in the charge. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I love it, right? You're not the one in charge. Your job is to empower and, and cultivate those in the charge. And obviously Sam and I, you know, we're very complimentary in our skill sets of being able to do that. You know, because on Sam's end, Sam's very good at creating the framework, right? He's very good at, you know, understanding the how, right? Hey, this is how we're going to get there. Um, and this is, you know, but as on my side, right, I'm very good at the why, right? The why and the who, right? So, hey, this is our team. This is our people. I'm very good at leading the people and, and, and driving them towards a vision and, and enforcing that vision. Um, so I'd say that's part of a, that's another really good reason as to why we are where we're at today, which is, you know, our, our quote unquote empire. Right, uh, is that you know our, we have very complementary skill sets. Yeah, that was fantastic. Um, and and you did touch on there uh, part of your skill set there, Daniel, saying it's like, hey, uh, I need to know where the market's at. I need to have a pulse on things. Um, you know, this has been fantastic today. So before we go, I did want to ask a little bit about that. And and I know you said you guys are in the middle of acquiring a, a single family home, um, especially, you know, obviously you said like, hey, it's, you know, markets are local. They're not, it's not all one, one big thing, uh, you know, moving together necessarily. But I would love to hear a little bit of your thoughts just because you guys put out great content on YouTube around that. Um, hear a little bit of your thoughts around your, you know, the state of the market, um, especially single family home um, and how you're, you're adjusting your strategy overall. Yeah. By, by the way, I just want to make it really clear. So somebody who's watching this podcast might think, oh my gosh, all they're doing right now is a single family house. Like, why should I listen to them? Right. <laughs> one deal. No, so just that's singled actually, out that example. Yeah, yeah. for sure. But that's actually for our parents. Uh, we're, we're actually buying okay. uh, properties locally that are smaller, right? Like the duplexes, the single family. Uh, so that by the time our, you know, our, our parents, they can live comfortably, right? In five years, 10 years, right? And I mean, we already kind of taken care of them now, right? But, but we want to really make sure that, you know, the, the nails in the coffin in terms of their, their financial security, not ours. So in terms of what's Great. happening with single, the single family housing market, right? I mean, if you look at the, the housing report and, 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 you know, Redfin, Zillow, and, now, and obviously the National Association of Realtors, they, they do a phenomenal job at putting out monthly reports. And, you know, if you look at the report for July, you know, obviously, you know, we've had the, the highest median sale price in the history of the United States at $385,000 per single family house. Um, and obviously the, the, the report for August is most likely going to decline. What's really interesting is um, I don't know if we've seen this a lot, you know, I'm a big history guy. So but what people don't know about me is well, when I was in college, I'm a college dropout, by the way. So, you know, no, hopefully no judgment. But uh, before I changed my major to uh, business, I was actually a history major for two years. And so I'm, I love history. You know, one of the things my wife and I did is we went to Boston and we checked out all the historical museums and we had a, we had a blast. Um, but if you study history, it's very few times in the history of our country where we're seeing what we're seeing now. We are obviously undoubtedly in a bubble. Um, now that bubble, the big question, right? Because that's, that's something you cannot deny. But I think the big debate that is happening right now is whether or not the underlying economic growth that is charging the bubble is sustainable. Uh, and it's very interesting what's happening currently. And by the way, bubbles can be created for all sorts of reasons. You know, I mean, if you look at the first asset bubble in the United States, most people don't know this. Maybe, Matt, maybe you know this. Do you know the first bubble? The first that bubble? Happened, the what first asset bubble that happened in the United States? No, to, uh, you always hear the tulip example. I don't know. Yeah. But. So the, the first asset bubble in the United States was in 1796, and it was actually around land, surprisingly. Interesting. So, huh. so you would think, right, in 1796, the country is expanding, right? We just got off a war with, with Britain. You would think that there wouldn't be a, a bubble around land, but, but sure enough, there was. And, and if you look at the real estate market, you know, every single almost vertical has their turn. You know, I mean, we, we had it with single family housing in 2008 with the mortgages and the subprime mortgage and whatnot. But what I'm seeing right now is a very interesting um, driver towards the pricing of assets currently. So obviously, there's a lot of artificial boosting that's happening. Um, if you look at what powers the single family housing market, it's mainly the central banking system. The way that the central banking system is being propped up right now is by what my friend Dave Seymour will call Mickey Mouse money. You know, meaning that not only do we have over $1 trillion in the reposition market, which is a lot of temporary cash to fund temporary operations, but, you know, we're seeing record numbers, obviously, in how much the Fed has in their balance sheet. You know, we a lot of times forget that the Fed's purchasing $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities every single month, which is 
a big reason as to why the mortgage rates are being kept so low. You know, so uh, aside from that, um, the big question for me and the big thing that we have to pay attention to is, you know, what are the big economic drivers that are fueling the cost of the single family house? On one side, you have a lot of individuals who are saying, well, the mortgage forbearances are keeping the, the, the uh, assets out of inventory, you know, and that's why that, you know, the single family housing is so, you know, is, is so big, right? It's the, the assets, right? Not, there's, there's not enough supply, too much demand, you know? And then, you know, a lot of people counter that by saying, well, you know, the number of supply of homes have been the exact same, the same time, right? It's, we're not, you know, there's the same amount. So it's just that the homes are flying off the shelves a lot faster. Um, and of course, what most people don't realize is obviously the millennial generation, which is us, you know, we are now at the time where we are in prime time home buying age. You know, a majority of your millennials are between that low to mid thirties, where a lot of times for people, that's when they buy their first serious home, right? I mean, they've got a couple of kids at that point, you know, they're a little bit more established in their career. So their financial prowess, and now they're, now they're looking to invest in a home that where they could live and, and build that equity. Um, you know, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of that's being priced out, right? And because, you know, now we have something that is, 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 is unseen more now than ever to the point where it's actually affecting our rental market. It's actually to the point where there's uh, finding a home is so difficult that rents have gone up because those individuals who can afford to buy the homes are now going into your class A apartment complexes as transi transitionary living. I mean, the amount of stories and, and, and cases I see of, you know, hey, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson just sold their house. They want to move into a new home. It's too expensive. And while it's being built or while they're waiting for the market to cool down, they sign a nine month lease with, a, with an a, you know, a apartment complex, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's an A class, right? I mean, the, the number of those individuals are historically higher than ever. And that's something that no one is talking about. So, you know, I, I think the thing that we have to really pay attention to is what are the big underlying organic, and that's the key, organic sustainable drivers that's fueling an individual market. Because at the end of the day, real estate is local. So if you look at even Illinois, right, we have record highs in median housing prices. We have record highs in what we're charging for rent but we're actually the second state that's losing the most people. So, you know, when you look at a market like that, you know, things don't seem right, right? So I think that's what we have to really pay attention to is that organic underlining economic growth that fuels, you know, the price of the single family house. Yeah. Yeah, well, Daniel, Sam, both of you guys, I mean, I really appreciate your thoughts. I really appreciate you taking the time out to educate our audience on, you know, how you see the world evolving and then specific tactics like, you know, everything you've outlined within your books. Um, I know you guys have your YouTube channel, your coaching, your website, your books. Um, we'll link to all those resources here in the YouTube uh, description as well. But um, what is the best way for our audience to get more involved with you and, and you know, uh, get started uh, with what you're working on? Yeah, honestly, it starts from, you know, YouTube channel, come check us out, right? Poke some hose on us, right? We don't, we don't necessarily want you to go and start buying our books and stuff. Uh, we, you know, we have free content on YouTube where we literally give away gold nuggets every week. Uh, so go come check us out. If you drive with us, if you li like what we have to say, and, and if you, you know, appreciate our perspective, then yeah, we have books uh, that you can check out. We have other, uh, we have free courses that we, we even give away. Uh, and then if you want to go deeper, then yeah, we have coaching programs, courses, all kinds of stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily ask people to go check those out first. Go check out our, some of our free stuff. Give us a test drive because there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of gurus out there and, and there's a lot of courses out there that promise one thing and don't necessarily deliver. Well, um, we want you to come and test this out, right. And, and think, check us out and see if we're legit or not. Um, you know, that, that, that in itself should give you a pretty good idea as far as kind of our style yeah. uh, of, of, of the content and, and how, how, how we present ourselves really in, in, in the marketplace. Yeah. Well, Sam, Daniel, I, again, really appreciate your time today. And, you know, thanks for uh, sharing your knowledge here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. To everyone watching, uh, this is Matt Camp with Deal Machine and happy deal finding.